Native Americans, the indigenous peoples who thrived in North America before the era of colonization. People distinguished by a unique bond with nature and profound spiritual beliefs. Yet some of their practices can come across as shocking for us today, especially when it comes to the sex rituals. Sexuality Customs Native American tribes were organized into clans, each clan with its own leadership, rituals and responsibilities. Belonging to the same clan meant considering each other as relatives. People from the same generation were addressed as brother or sister, making it taboo to engage in sexual relations or marry within the same clan. A detailed study of the 18th century Wyandot, a confederacy of Native American tribes, revealed that despite their population of 500 to 600 people, there were no marriages within the same clan, maintaining the practice of exogamy or marrying outside the clan. During adolescence, young boys and girls were free to pursue romantic relationships with multiple suitors. In their late teens and early 20s, individuals began considering settling down. Clan mothers, responsible for each longhouse, initiated negotiations for potential marriages. While the young woman had a say in choosing her preferred suitor, she was never forced into marriage unless she intended to keep a child. Abortion and adoption were available options if traditional contraceptives failed. Even in cases of pregnancy, the woman's choice of a suitor was honored, regardless of biological fatherhood. She was not obliged to reveal the father's identity, but recognition was considered an honor. Marriage Rituals Once the young woman selected a potential husband, her clan mothers proposed the union to his clan mothers. Consent was expressed through the presentation of gifts, unless the man strongly opposed the marriage. The couple then entered a trial marriage, overseen by the woman's clan mothers, lasting several weeks. If issues arose, the young man and his gifts were returned. If successful, they progressed to a full marriage, celebrated with a feast in the man's longhouse. Subsequently, the couple lived in the woman's longhouse under the authority of her clan mothers. Marital disputes were the responsibility of the clan mothers, who settled issues and, if necessary, facilitated divorce for reasons such as infertility, constant arguments, domestic violence or ineptitude. Either partner could request a divorce usually granted unless children were involved, in which case extreme situations were required. Children were the primary obligation of marriage, and monogamy was not mandatory. Men could engage in extramarital affairs with hunting wives, women who accompanied hunting parties and rejected traditional roles. Women could also have multiple husbands. Infidelity Norms Infidelity among the tribes did occur. Native Americans even had a term for it, but it involved individuals from different clans. Finding a suitable place for such encounters was challenging, because each house belonged to a specific clan, housing between 8 to 70 people. The Wendat, for example, were traders, with men often traveling long distances by canoe to visit established trading partners from other nations. These journeys might have included the establishment of marital connections, strengthening social bonds between trading partners and nations. Early European accounts described these relationships from a male perspective, often overlooking the possibility that young women played a role in decision-making in these matters. Unlike their European counterparts, Aboriginal women of that time generally had more influence in choosing and ending relationships. During the courting process, when a young man visited a girl in the evening, he engaged in conversation with her in the central area of the lodge, with other adults in close proximity. The use of courting flutes was a common practice, yet the girl was restricted from leaving her lodge upon hearing the flute being played. As the young man became more earnest in his pursuit of the girl, he demonstrated his capability to provide for a family by presenting the girl's parents with a deer or another animal he had hunted. If invited to stay and share a meal, this signaled the parents' approval, allowing the young man greater freedom of movement. In a symbolic gesture, a Potawatomi youth gifted the girl a blanket, and if she permitted him to drape it over her shoulders, 
it signified her agreement to marry him. It was observed that most marriages adhered to a monogamous structure. However, polygyny, involving multiple wives, was officially sanctioned. Notably, individuals of importance, particularly men, were occasionally permitted to have two or rarely three wives. Relations with Europeans after Europeans came to North America, cases of relations between Native Americans and Europeans were frequently, Europeans would come in and intermarry or just have a short period of relations with American Indian women to help set up trading networks, with said women sometimes being treated rather badly because of such things being traditional among American Indians. The Europeans would do this and sometimes go as far as demanding it but in contrast would refuse the same treatment for their male American Indian trading partners and European women. The American Indian men were fed up with not being allowed to intermarry with European women and fed up with the European double standard on the subject, and they were also showing disrespect for the Europeans' Christianity. Wild Rituals The so-called Vondat had more open and free attitudes towards sex compared to the French norms brought to Canada then called New France. A particular Wondat sexual ceremony illustrates this cultural difference. In the Huron country, there were gatherings of all the girls in a town at a sick woman's bedside, either at her request based on a vision or dream she had, or by the shaman's order for her health. When the girls gathered, each was asked which young man from the town she would like to spend the night with. They named their choices, and the selected young men were notified. In the evening, they all slept together in the presence of the sick woman from one end of the lodge to the other. Throughout the night, two chiefs sang and rattled tortoise shells. This ceremony continued until the next morning when it concluded. It's worth noting that the young women were the ones making the choices, emphasizing the importance and respect given to women in Wendat culture. The first person to reveal this type of ceremonies was Jesuit father Jerome Lallemant in 1639. He recounted a story about an old man named Taur Henshe who was on his deathbed. Through mysterious hints that people had to decipher, Taur Henshe expressed his wish for a white dog ceremony, enough cornmeal to feed everyone involved, and some other unspecified rituals. The finale of the event included a andaquanda ceremony involving the pairing of men with girls, held at the conclusion of the feast. Taur Henshe specified the presence of 12 girls and a 13th for himself. Upon receiving this information, the council promptly gathered the necessary items, thanks to the generosity and voluntary contributions of those present. These individuals were willing to part with their most precious possessions on such occasions. The captains then took to the streets and public places as well as through the cabins, loudly announcing the desires of the ailing man and urging people to fulfill them without delay. They didn't stop at a single announcement, repeating the message three or four times with such urgency that it seemed as if the entire well-being of the country depended on it. Simultaneously, they documented the names of the girls and men who volunteered to fulfill the main request of the sick man. During the feast, these names were announced, followed by congratulations from all present and the distribution of the best pieces. Finally, the sick man expressed gratitude for the restored health, attributing his cure to this remedy. The name of the ceremony was Endakwandet, which literally means, they are enveloped in sex. If you wished for the ceremony, you would say, Tayendakwandeten, be enveloped in sex for me. This ritual seems to demonstrate that their publicly articulated attitude towards sex was one that it was something to celebrate, not constrain and it suggests that female sexuality was something thought natural, not something to be controlled. The Wendat language had no terms for innocence or guilt, so did not have those cultural concepts to condemn female sexuality.